So my name is Jessica Snyder and I'm the Vice President of the Graduate Student Association. And on behalf of the Graduate Studies Office and the Graduate Student Association, I'd like to welcome you all here. And I'd like to say good morning or good afternoon to our people joining us uh, via Adobe Connect Online. So we are going to be having moderated discussion and a couple panelists talk about their research today. Um, and it's also going to be archived online, so moms and dads can watch at home. So go light on the cuss words during the question session. Um, okay, so with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, who is Larry Milliken from the Haggerty Library, Humanities and Social Science. Larry? Right. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to keep my talking brief so we can hear these great presentations. We have uh, three... Um, scholars here who are going to tell us a little bit about themselves and about the research that they're working on. Um, first up is going to be uh, Kristen Ken, who's a JD candidate at the Earl Max School of Law. And then after that we have Erica Caden, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics. And our closer is going to be uh, Christy Just, who's a GERT fellow. Um, Eigert? Eigert. Is, is it Eigert? I it couldn't remember Eigert. which version was right. Okay. All right, so it's an Eigert fellow um, and PhD student from material science and engineering at the uh, A.J. Drexel um, it's, it's Nanotechnology Institute. Um, fascinating talks. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, after each one, we'll take um, really just one or two questions and then move on to the next panelist. And then at the end, um, after ever, all three have gone, um, I'll come back up and we can um, have a longer question and answer, answer period. Okay, so, Kristen Kent. Um, so just a little bit about me and my background. I um, went to the University of Maryland for undergrad where I studied German and political science. And I also studied, um, I pursued a certificate in women's studies and also did a lot with international relations. So I came into law school with an interest in reproductive rights and women's health issues generally. Um, so I was very excited when last year as a second year law student, I was asked to help out on a and provide research for a case that my constitutional law professor was litigating. Um, he's right there, thank you, David. Um, <laughs> and so I was especially excited because this case involves representing an abortion clinic um, and the clinic director who are being sued by the protesters, by people that protest outside of the clinic. Um, and I was really interested in this case um, because the facts of the case were really interesting. Um, in this case, the protesters sued the clinic, claiming that the clinic had violated the protesters' First Amendment rights. Um, and they said that the clinic violated their First Amendment rights because at abortion clinics, at many clinics across the country, what happens is, uh, and it's particularly in this clinic in Allentown, um, protesters outside of the clinic will, as patients are walking in, will um, try to grab the patients, force literature on them, say things to them, try to intimidate them. So at this particular clinic, and at clinics across the country, to solve this problem and sort of help patients get into the clinics, many people oftentimes volunteer as escorts and kind of walk with the patient into the clinic, console them, make sure that everything happens um, quickly, safely, efficiently. So in Allentown, in order to prevent the um, protesters from grabbing patients, the escorts began holding up tarps that sort of blocked the people, the patients walking into the clinic, from the protesters who were trying to grab and force literature on them. And when they started using these tarps, the protesters became really ups upset and sued the clinic, saying that these tarps are violating our First Amendment right to free speech, that we can't speak to these patients, this is violating our rights. So I was very excited as a second year law student, having just taken constitutional law, to know that this legal claim is bogus. This is not a legal claim. The reason why is because the Constitution only applies to govern the government. Only the government can violate your constitutional rights. So when teaching this doctrine in con law, um, Professor Cohen uses this example that, right, you can all invite people over for dinner at your house, and if you don't like what they say, you can kick them out of your house and not violate their First Amendment rights. So coming onto this case as a law student, having just learned this, 
I said, this is crazy. This is not a legal claim because this is a private clinic and an individual. Um, turns out, uh, I got on the case three years into the litigation. So I was shocked that this had gone on for three years and that eventually the claim was thrown out, but in the meantime, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with our legal system and that things take a long time. And so through these three years, the clinic director was dragged in and out of court and went through the discovery process depositions. And I got to know her and saw what a toll this litigation took on her. And I was frustrated because thinking, I'm a law student getting into this profession, and I see, I saw the law being used as a form of protest, right? So the protesters are not only outside the clinic, but here they're, I saw them using the law against, as a form of protest against the clinic and the clinic director. Um, and also through the course of this representation, I got to know the clinic director, and I learned how the protesters also affect her and affect her life beyond the lawsuit. So for example, the, the same protesters that brought this lawsuit that I became involved in follow her home from work. They pick it outside of her home. Um, they drive by her house. They send flyers throughout her community and say inappropriate and mean things to her neighbors. Um, one particular protester publishes her name and address and all sorts of identifying information about her and other providers and sends that identifying information in a newsletter to people that are currently in prison for committing violent acts against abortion providers. He also publishes this on a website. So her, all of her identifying information is very <coughs> public. And what I think really got me was her saying that in response to this protest and this all of this that's happening to her, she wears a bulletproof vest to work. And I was, I was sitting with her, and I was, she told me this, and I was thinking, you're an accountant. Like, I don't know any other accountant who wears a bulletproof vest to work out of fear of something that's happening to you. Um, and I thought to myself, this story needs to get out. This story needs to be told. This is not what we think about when we think about abortion or reproductive rights. We don't think about accountants and clinic, clinic directors having to wear a bulletproof vest to work. Um, so I got talking with the professor who invited me to research on this case, and we both decided that this is something that needs to be looked at. And we were wondering, is this something that only happens in Allentown or not. And also, because my original thought about this was my frustration with the law, we were wondering, like, what does law do? What can law do? So we designed a study to answer that exact question. Um, we designed a research project to interview providers around the country and see and learn about their experiences with this personalized harassment, right? Beyond just the clinic protesting, but this personalized following you home, bothering your community, etc. And we conducted um, hour to hour and a half long interviews um, with providers, sort of with two goals in mind. Um, so, of course, we wanted to tell these stories. We think that just getting the story out is really important. Um, but of course, because we're law students and lawyers, we want to learn how the law helps or doesn't help the providers deal with their personalized harassment. Um, so over the last year, we've traveled around the country. Um, we've talked to 83 people, ranging from clinic escorts, doctors, nurses, etc. Um, people who work in clinics and hospitals, people who um, are associated with providing abortions in over 30 states. And we also talk to people of varying ages and levels of experience. So from students to doctors and professionals who have done this for decades and decades. Um, what did we learn? Well, harassment, this type of individualized, personalized harassment, affects everyone associated with abortion provision. Um, we heard stories from friends of abortion providers who are personally targeted. Um, and we also learned that harassment takes various forms. Providers receive death threats. They're picketed at home. Um, we've heard stories of people being involved in car chases with protesters. Physical violence. Ch people's children have been harassed and followed to school. Um, again, my original understanding of the law as a form of harassment. Um, people have had random interactions in grocery stores, like a protester will say a mean thing to someone in the grocery store. People have been stalked online. Murder, right? 
you all probably remember the news in 2009, Dr. Tiller was murdered in his church um, by an anti-abortion protester. Um, so this is another example, of this type of wanted style poster that we've seen that are oftentimes displayed online or set throughout a community. And all four of these individuals who are pictured in the wanted posters were eventually murdered. So that's, again, another form of individualized harassment. Um, so I was also very interested in learning about how, the, how our subjects, how the interviewees, respond to the harassment that they, that they face, right? Some of them were very fearful. Some of them also had very calculated responses. So I'll read a couple quotes to you guys. Um, Ever since all this stuff happened, I tell you, when I get up, and frequently, I have a water bottle I keep at my bedside, because I wake up at night, and I'll be a little thirsty, I'll drink a little water. Before I go to bed, I always fill my water bottle up, and I keep it by my bedside, and I typically go to bed 11.30, 12 o'clock. I'm a late night person. My son's the same way. He doesn't go to bed until 2. I'm in the kitchen, and it's dark outside, and I'm standing in front of my kitchen window, and I'll tell you, more than just a couple times, I'm thinking, is there going to be a rifle shot coming through this window? And I never used to think like that. That was furthest from my mind until these protested, protests start. Um, and then another. And they finally did protest at my home. And so it was always a situation of how do I protect my children to a more calculated response. Well, how do you assess risk? The risk has two components, right? It's what are the chances and then what's the impact? The impact would be very bad, but the chances are very low. I don't know. I think I have a very commonsensical attitude about what really are the risks. The risk is much greater driving to work and being hit by a bus than being a victim of um, violence. And then this one is particularly interesting to me. You just try not to let that intimidate you. I think we have a job to do. It's a job we believe in. It's the same as a soldier in the field, a cop on the beat, the fireman going into a building. It's something we do for the better of <coughs> Um, I find this quote especially interesting because here you have people in abortion care comparing what they do to being a soldier or a fire, firefighter or a police officer. Um, so right now in the project, we just got all of our transcripts back from the transcriptionist. We're going through um, and pulling out excerpts, trying to find out um, different aspects of people's stories that are particularly interesting. Um, right now, I'm my specific role, I'm writing an article about what motivates these providers to keep working and keep doing this job, notwithstanding all of this horrible protest. Um, so I guess as I, in closing, I um, actually wanted to thank all of you for coming and listening to this and to thank the Graduate Student Association for hosting this. Um, I think it's important for us to share our passions and our research because I think as researchers we often become entrenched in what we do and forget why what we do matters. Um, especially here with, my, with this research that I'm doing. Like getting these stories out is what my research is all about. So thank you all for the opportunity and thank you for listening. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, the legal process in general is really lengthy. There are long filing deadlines. Parties have a long time to respond. Um, the judges in varying districts are slower than not. People bring new claims. It's just, I think the legal system allows for lawsuits to take a really long time, even if the claim is, in my, like, is as it was in my opinion, really frivolous. Out of curiosity, you probably met your opposite numbers. I'm sorry? You probably met your opposite numbers. The uh, lawyers who represent the uh, people who are suing. Um, I did not. My, my role was only just to provide research. But in doing so, I sort of recognized exactly what was going on. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if they share the viewpoints that they're litigating for, or if they're, you know, seen. Perhaps. Uh, but just interested in making a buck. Yeah, no, it is it is interesting, and perhaps because I certainly share, right? Like as a, as a person, I identify with the person who I was sort of representing. Um, so perhaps so. Okay, uh, we'll have some more questions uh, at the end. And next, I'd like to bring up uh, Eric again.
department here at Drexel. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my research in the Double Show Collaboration. Um, I went to the College of New Jersey, it's a small state school. I graduated in 2005. Um, I'm the founder of the Physics Graduate Student Association, kind of like a subgroup. Um, uh, in 2008, I went to, I was the, one of the Drexel uh, representatives at the 50th Lindau meeting of Nobel laureates. I got to spend an a week on an island with 600 other graduate students and 25 Nobel Prize winners. That was pretty amazing. And you know, thanks to Drexel's rising position as a research university, it really afforded me that opportunity. And I'm a member of the Double Show Collaboration. We are you know, about 200 scientists and 37 institutions uh, across seven countries and four continents studying uh, particles called neutrinos. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about neutrinos, what uh, my experiment is trying to measure and what my research niche is in the middle. <coughs> so neutrinos, That. Uh, neutrinos come from a variety of sources. They are elementary particles like electrons or, uh, or quarks are. They come from the they come from the sun, from uh, the Big Bang. We have new, uh, relic neutrinos from supernova stars that explode. There are neutrinos that come from cosmic rays, uh, protons and photons that you know, come about in the atmosphere or they come about around in space and interact in the atmosphere, we get neutrinos from them. Uh, in our own bodies, potassium-40 decays and produces neutrinos. You can get them from accelerators, like the Tevatron in Chicago and the LHC, the big accelerator at CERN. There are neutrinos from radioactive decays <coughs> of materials in the crust of the Earth. And we think that there are neutrin that there's a nuclear reactor in the center of the Earth, and that's what produces the, the heat, why our planet is warm. We think neutrinos come from that. And from uh, man-made nuclear <coughs> reactors. This is actually a, a picture of the reactor site that I work on. It's a small town on the French-Belgian border. So why are neutrinos interesting, other than they come from so many different sources? Neutrinos come in different flavors. Um, electron, muon, and tau flavors is how we call them and they change what flavor they are as they travel through space. So imagine that you're an eagle, and you're flying through space, and you're like, man, I'm great, I'm an eagle. So you fly, and a little bit later, you turn, you look down, and you've turned into a parrot. Like, oh, I'm so cool, I'm a bird, I'm a parrot, I'm pretty. So you're flying along, long through space, and you look down again, and you're a duck. Neutrinos are the same way. As they travel through space, they change what flavor they are. They're still a neutrino, but they're different kinds. So neutrinos are not only interesting, but also very useful. They're the only particle that we have detected that is beyond our standard model. Of <coughs> these, uh, these rules, uh, this, we call them the standard model, explain everything that we know so far. We um, and so we keep looking for different particles to try and extend the standard model or to find out if there's physics beyond it. And neutrinos are the only particle that actually have properties that are not yet predicted by the standard model that we have found so far. Um, neutrinos from the sun can tell us all about the chemical composition of the sun and all the processes that go inside. The light that comes from the sun interacts electromagnetically and then therefore takes longer to get out of the sun and then propagate through space. Neutrinos don't interact in that way, so they can tell us more about the processes that happen inside without getting caught up on everything that's happening inside the sun. Um, <clears throat> so neutrinos can also help us monitor nuclear reactors, which is where a lot of our funding comes from using, uh, by studying this. Um, uh, by, so the neutrinos ha have different energies, and then different reactor fuels can tell us, uh, give neutrinos of different energies. So by studying the energy of the neutrinos that we detect, we can tell the ratio of uh, fuel inside the reactor. So if a country wants nuclear power, but we don't necessarily trust them with nuclear weapons, we can build a detector right next to them and tell if they're skimming fuel off the top to possibly build nuclear weapons by the shape of the neutrino spectrum. 
So that's really, really uh, prominent in uh, research in the Department of Energy. So, and understanding how neutrinos mix, how they turn from, you know, say an eagle into a parrot into a duck, can tell us why our universe is even here, why we are matter dominated. Because the, the process that, uh, that neutrinos change through includes this term that violates what we call CP, charge parity, but um, actually this cartoon will explain it a lot better. So we have the Big Bang. Energy exploded. Which should have turned into equal parts of matter and antimatter. Energy does that, and then they would have uh, collided back together, and it would have been nothing. It would have been just energy again. But it wasn't quite equal parts matter and antimatter. After they collided again, there was just a little bit of matter left over. So why, whatever, why matter was favored over antimatter? Why we're even here today? Neutrinos can help us understand this. So my work is on a project called Double Shell. We have, here are there two uh, nuclear reactor cores, and we have a far detector and a near detector. So we measure the number of uh, neutrinos that come out of this reactor. They're emitted isotropically, evenly in all directions. So by counting the number of neutrinos that are still in this electron flavor type at a near detector, and then counting the number of neutrinos at a farther distance after some have turned from electron type into other types, the muon and tau types, um, we can tell this last number that governs how neutrinos change. It's uh, called a mixing angle. So this, the deficit gives us this value. So then by finding this value, we can look into other properties of neutrinos, filling in all the numbers in our equation. So my work is in neutrino directionality. Uh, a neutrino from a nuclear reactor interacts with a proton and produces a positron and a neutron. So here this positron interacts with an electron and gives off light, and the neutron <coughs> interacts with another nucleus and gives off light. So we have two, um, two bursts of light that are correlated in time, and that's how we know we have a neutrino. So the, the neutron actually comes off of this interaction in the same direction that the neutrino is coming. It just bounces like a billiard ball. So we can create a, a vector, an arrow, that points from the, where the positron hits this initial location to where the neutron hits, and compare that to a, a vector or an arrow from the reactor to our detector. And they should point along the same line. Um, the cosine of the angle between them should be more positive than negative uh, after enough statistics. And that's what we show here. This is, this is my, one of my results. So the, uh, the black points are our actual data, and the red lines are cons uh, computer simulated data. So it does point more towards positive one than negative one. And so by uh, having enough statistics, we can actually point back towards the reactor. Uh, within a 10 degree cone, which is really, uh, really useful for this anti-nuclear proliferation if we, uh, we can just put a detector anywhere, uh, see neutrinos, find them back to the source, and say, what are you doing with this nuclear material that we didn't let you have? So neutrinos are fundamental pro uh, particles that tell us about physics beyond our standard model. They can tell us how or why the universe is matter-dominated, why we're even here. And they can help in nuclear reactor monitoring, which is um, big books uh, industry. And Drexel is definitely at the forefront of neutrino research. There's other experiments that collaborative uh, colleagues here are on in detecting other neutrino properties. So thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I have a few questions. One is, could you explain a little better uh, the process of CP symmetry breaking? Not its consequences, but the actual asymmetry. Where does it come from? Is it a higher energy barrier? Or is it uh, some process that only takes place if one neutrino is uh, antiparticle? And the second question, recently in the news, uh, there was a report from the LHC that there is an observed, um, the observed ratio 
of neutrinos to antineutrinos, so like 10 times higher than the standard model predicts? Um, is that something that you've heard about and can comment on? So the second question first, I haven't heard that yet. That'd be very interesting. Um, Uh, so that would actually feed into the why we're here, why um, our reaction would favor you know, neutrino, producing neutrinos over anti-neutrinos. Um, but no, I haven't heard that yet, so I don't think I can actually comment anymore. And the first question was delving into CP violation. Um, I mean, I guess, so, I'm sorry, uh, could you say it again? Um. If you could talk about CP symmetry uh, violation, of what exactly is involved in it, rather than what its consequences are, we all agree with um, basically the amount of matter versus the amount of matter in the universe. Um, what about what can you say about the process itself for a lay audience um, <laughs> that would help us understand a little better? So CP violation, or or the process of, is when uh, a reaction would favor creating. Uh, products that have that are made of matter over antimatter particles over antiparticles. So we we would expect. I mean, this is something that happens in quarks, which is actually how it was discovered. But the amount of time that it happens in quarks is not enough amount. The amount of time that it favors matter over antimatter is not enough asymmetry to produce even our galaxy, much less our entire universe. So that's why they're looking into. Um, finding sources of CP violation in neutrinos. We don't yet know if it exists because the value that would determine how much CP violation in neutrinos is uh, attached with this last number, this mixing angle that my experiment is measuring. So we're not even sure yet if it exists, and we're just at the point that we can build detectors to try and find out if it exists. But it's essentially this reaction that would favor uh, creating particles over antiparticles. Um, okay, so I think let's uh, go ahead and, and move on to Christy Jaws, and um, we'll have more questions at the end. science because I really wanted to work on fashion and technology and really essentially developing smart textiles or electronic textiles that aren't just you know plastics or hard materials that uh, we would see in our computer in your clipper in the projector but something that you could really wear and feel comfortable wearing and but also look at not just the uh, design aspect of it where it could be comfortable it could be beautiful but what kind of advanced materials can we actually use to develop these systems? So, and of course, I have to thank my uh, advisor, Yuri Bibilti, and my co-advisor, Jovia Vion. We were working together. You're at the end, don't worry. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, my, uh, my peer, uh, Carlos Perez, who's sitting in the back, who asked a couple of very difficult questions earlier. Um, for a really wonderful experience the last few years uh, collaborating and researching on this topic. Um, so what is fashionable technology? What is the, com the combination of fashion and technology? And uh, these are just a couple examples, uh, really more from the design realm, where in this case they actually embedded solar panels into a dress, and the dress transforms, changes its shape, but they were able to do it in such a way that it was seamless, it was beautiful, it was just, everything was automated and on its own. It was, it was essentially a robotic dress, and uh, the part that I found most interesting was that the undergarment, uh, or the corset that's underneath actually supports all, you know, all the solar panels, the other heavy materials, 
has mechanical systems throughout the corset, but they did it in such a way that you don't know what's underneath this dress. Um, another example from the same designer, uh, he's based out of London, his name is Hussein Chilin. He made a Swarovski crystal laser dresses. Um, and essentially wanted to accentuate how light refracts through crystals, um, but then also could you wear that in a way. So a lot of this is more artistic expression. Can I use technology in a way that I can further express myself? Um, but what I'm more interested in is, you know, I can't really wear this to the grocery store. You know, I can't use this in my everyday life. And I really wanted to enable future designers, future engineers, to be able to create, you know, their own types of wearable technologies. I want to really give everyone the opportunity to have, you know, not just wear your iPod per se, but you know, be able to express yourself as well as have these different kinds of functionalities in a way that you can wear them and people wouldn't really know the difference. It could do, you know, you have a conductive yarn and you have a regular yarn. They look exactly the same, but one conducts electricity and one does not. Or that yarn could, you know, store energy, uh, light up, so on and so forth. What can you really do? So currently on the market, uh, the Nike Fit, in my opinion, is the only uh, really, um, not just commercialized, but really the, the one successful piece of wearable technology right now. Uh, because it's just a pedometer, you're able to put it into your shoe. It is hard, it's not made of uh, soft textiles, but all of our shoes are solid for the most part. You know, it doesn't impede on what you do, but it adds a new functionality. It syncs with your iPhone, you know, how fast you're running, how far you've gone. Um, and there's a number of other capabilities that you can do. So, and then a couple other examples. This is the hug shirt. Uh, they use a uh, conductive textiles, and when you hug yourself, um, oh, and with nitinol, uh, which is a memory alloy, but you hug yourself, and someone else uh, wearing the same jacket will then feel a hug from you. <laughs> 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 smart systems, you know, what's something that I would want to wear, what's something that, you know, maybe for the design uh, aspect of this a little bit uh, more fashion forward, but the same elements apply where we could take these same technologies uh, like solar panels and really embed them into fabrics, take uh, energy storage systems, uh, excuse me, energy storage, uh, integrated textile circuitry, and use it to, you know, power uh, an audio system that you have right in your garment. But what's most important is how do we get to this point? So I really focus on integrating electronics into textiles and clothing, and do so by using materials and manufacturing methods that are widespread in the apparel industry. Because it's great when you have the latest new technique, um, you know, very very expensive equipment, but then that means that no one can really buy this. It's going to end up being, you know, a thousand dollar jacket, maybe even a ten thousand dollar jacket, because the cost isn't low enough, the techniques aren't low enough. But then also, it's very difficult to translate, you know, between the textile industry and, you know, engineering and material science. So it's really about using them together, um, making materials, and then using the techniques that textile manufacturers are already familiar with in order to create these different kinds of garments and textiles. Um, and then again, that ties into, can we use textile structures, the structure of a weave, the structure of a knit, to really make circuits right into the fabric um, and make it one seamless system. So again, it's something that you want to wear. It's not just, oh, I stuck a light onto my jacket and now I'm, I have a tron, a tron suit. You know, it's really taking it to a sophisticated level um, and this is really only possible because I'm able to collaborate between fashion design, material science, electrical <coughs> engineering. Uh, we also work with the College of Nursing and Health Professions. The iSchool works with my co-advisor, Jean-Bierre Dion. Uh, Shima Seiki is uh, one of our new industry partners. The fashion school just got a new $1 million knitting lab. And it's... Oh, it's going to be a beautiful lab. I'm really excited. So uh, thank you to Jumbia for 
uh, getting everything together for that because it really means that now we can start making garments and now we can start really making fully integrated systems. So I'll get into why that is. Um, quick note, we work on a variety of projects in our group. Uh, we have a couple students working on communications or antennas. Uh, I work on energy storage, so we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and the theme of everything is how can we use nanotechnology and nanomaterials that are safe, okay, okay, um, to really enhance uh, the systems that we're making. Um, and then again, knitting will really be an essential part because it's really how we're going to integrate uh, all these energy, or rather, all these different devices uh, into one piece of clothing. And then, of course, this has a lot of applications in healthcare, the military, uh, you could have biosensors, you could have new types of bulletproof vests that, you know, maybe just by uh, charging it, it changes form and suddenly you're able to be protected from bullets. So 3D knitting. Again, uh, Fashion School just got a, uh, you know, one million dollar new facility. It's going to be brand new. Uh, hopefully by September we'll have it. Um, but the beauty of knitting is you program the machine to create this new architecture or textile structure. Um, but because it's knitting, or rather loops intertwining into each other, then coming back and looping into that first row that you made, then looping back into the next row, you can begin to make different shapes. And you can make circular shapes. You can make bifurcated tubes where you can stop and start again, um, rather than a weave where you can only have back and forth and up and down crisscrossing in between each other. Um, you know, and you can create some really beautiful three-dimensional structures. Uh, this is a dress by Sandra Buckland. I mean, it, if you look at the texture that's in this garment, but it, it comes out right out of the machine. They're really capable of just knitting you a sweater. I want to wear a red sweater today. Oh, where's that program? Boop, 20 minutes. You have a sweater. It's, I mean, it's a really amazing technology, but it's also customizable. Um, because if you can make one red sweater, why can't you make 150, maybe 1,000, maybe 100,000? Because the machine just keeps going because you've already set, um, you've already programmed it to do this one task. And now it can do it really well over and over again. And that's one uh, way that we believe that we can actually reduce the cost of wearable technology. Because if I can make 100,000 and I don't have to change anything except you can change the sizes, which is for me, at least, very special, um, you know, it really means that it, it's, it's possible to make these different devices. Um, another really special uh, aspect uh, to 3D knitting is the fact that you can do what's called intarsion knitting. And essentially, rather than just having uh, your smart yarn <coughs> um, embedded within one textile, you can select where you put these yarns which means you're not going to have a short in your circuit, um, you know, with everything just in one material, but you can identify, you can, you can make circuits right in one piece of fabric. And then if you can make circuits, who's to say you can't make, you know, batteries, antennas, um, sensors, and everything else that we're working on. And then that goes back to my role as a material scientist where I have to make the materials, you know, and we work with people who are wonderful, Carlos in the back is my right hand man, um, but, you know, we can make the materials, but now we can also make them into real, you know, not just prototypes, but real products that people are excited to wear, that w they want to wear, and then, again, coming from the design side of it, it doesn't just have to work, but it can look really good, too, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's really important because there's a lot of designers that make <coughs> interesting clothes, um, you know, it, it, but they don't really make the person look good. You know, it's a very beautiful piece of uh, clothing, but it makes her, you know, look kind of frumpy. I don't know, it, it, however you want to put it, but um, if you're designing it really well, if you're engineering it really well, and you're assembling it really well, and you're manufacturing it really well, and you're selling it really well, I don't really see the problem. Smart textiles need fundamentally 
it's energy. Because like any electronic device, we all need energy. We need energy. Um, something that uh, I found out from one of our colleagues, uh, actually John Miller. Thank you, Mr. John Miller. Um, this, he said that a teaspoon of sugar is equivalent to the energy that's stored in a D-cell battery. I mean, think about it. You just eating a teaspoon of sugar is a D-cell battery. That's, that's a lot of energy that's just, you know, that we consume on a daily basis. Um, and then to actually have to store it, you know, how much more space um, you need. And then on top of that, if you go into uh, electrochemical capacitors, which is actually what I work on, um, but essentially our energy storage devices, you need even more of that. You need, you know, a block this big to store the same amount of energy. So then you have to begin to think about, okay, I need a lot of space to store this kind of energy. And textiles are really mostly two-dimensional. Um, and often in your electronic devices, about, I'd say it's about 70% of your device is just a battery, which is amazing. Um, so, uh, I, again, you saw a couple other figures uh, with you know, various devices embedded in them. Um, I worked with uh, Dr. John Miller to come up with, well, and the people at Science, they adapted a uh, few things and really made these wonderful figures that illustrate, you know, you can combine energy storage systems with uh, piezoelectric systems where you actually store energy for movement. Uh, you can also do thermo, uh, electric and store energy from your body heat. Uh, there's so many different types of technologies, but again, can you actually make it into a textile? And that's really what's most important. So, um, again, solar panels, uh, military applications, and everyday applications. And I think that's kind of what's special is you can do both. Um, and so just to briefly touch on it, uh, again, as I said before, I do work with nanomaterials, um, mo mainly carbon nanomaterials, uh, the A.J. Jackson Nanotechnology Institute. And what's really special about them is that they can be capacitive or store a lot of energy or they could just be very conductive, or they could be semiconductive. And if you have these three different properties, these are really the three properties that govern electronic systems, which is why there's been a lot of buzz about graphene, nanotubes, and a number of other uh, materials in the news. So now it's really been my job to utilize these materials uh, for energy storage systems. So, and again, you can use these in combination, which is probably even the better part. So you can have something that's very conductive and highly capacitive. It doesn't always happen. Um, but really the technology behind it and really understanding the properties of this, and then again combining it with yarns, combining it with knitting, it just, it just works. So uh, I'd like to thank a lot of people. Um, very briefly, uh, again, my advisors, uh, Yuri Gugotsi and Jovi Dion. I am an Eigert Fellow, um, so they pay me to do this and they let me go to school here. Um, the entire fashion technology team, uh, the nanophotonics group, again, Carlos Perez, who's sitting in the back and who decided to ask a couple of interesting questions, um, Jake McDonough, Elizabeth Plowman, and Nicholas Vasirka. They've all been a really wonderful, uh, supportive team and a really good collaboration. So, thank you.
it's challenging. And how, what are your couple of advices to students who are also involved in digital research and have some ideas and can additional background? I think it's really important that I did collaborate with material science for, you know, two and a half years before I even went into a PhD program because the amount of knowledge that you get just from working with people is incredible. I mean, really, really extensive. Um, but if you just want to, you know, cut and dry, go into something else, <coughs> I do recommend doing, I mean, really sitting down and think, saying to yourself, am I capable of accomplishing, you know, the classes, the workload, a number of other things, you know, I've been in it for so long, I graduated on June 11th and I restarted, or I started my PhD on June 13th, it just kind of was streamlined, I never really stopped. Um, but I, I think that's important, if, you, if you're going to just up and change fields, really know why you're doing it, um, but also do your best to understand exactly what you're getting into, because I knew exactly what I was getting into. I knew everyone that I was going to work with. I knew exactly what courses I had to take. And I really prepped myself for it. So that's, that's my advice. Um, how do the knitting machines that you showed that are programmable differ from standard uh, industrial knitting technology? Um, these are very, how should I put it? Standard uh, industrial knitting technology, um, it's typically, OK, I know what it is. You have one bed of needles in knitting. Uh, or Okay, I, I don't know. I assume I know nothing about knitting. Okay. Um, in a standard knitting setup, you'll have needles that go back and forth um, and will actually loop these yarns into each other, essentially. Uh, in the 3D machines, you actually have six beds of these needles. Um, and it becomes essentially a looping process that's very complicated and very complex, but... Um, by having multiple beds, you can then create multiple layers, um, and then you can intertwine the different layers within the different beds. Um, and that's really the special part of it, is that you can bring in a new yarn and start a new layer, um, or you could just get rid of a new layer, and maybe you have um, you know, a flat piece of fabric, and then suddenly you just have a pleat up here, because you can really um, pull all the yarns into one area using these kinds of machines, which you really can't do um, otherwise in standard name technology. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and move over to the, to the table and, and we have time to ask all three of our panelists um, more questions. to make everything work out. 
So they had to build this bubble chamber to then hopefully detect this particle. And if they detected it, it would you know, confirm this theory. And the, the whole process that that's how particle physics is done really amazed me. And that's what made me decide to go on to grad school and continue to study it. Um, so actually, my interest in, um, in reproductive justice, reproductive rights, is one of the reasons I went to law school in the first place. Um, in college at the University of Maryland, I participated in this research practicum at the Library of Congress where I studied uh, maternal health and maternal health policy around the, around the globe. Um, and that was such an amazing semester, and I sort of realized that I wanted to pursue a career that, had, that could translate into um, maybe eventually doing policy work. And then here at Drexel, I've just had unbelievable opportunities to pursue, pursue that interest. Um, really for me, uh, I had a research co-op uh, my junior year of uh, undergrad and it was really a nice experience to just kind of get thrown into a lab environment uh, from just being in design and it was very, very interesting how, you know, after the first couple days in the lab where I didn't have any idea what I was doing, um, it just kind of, things began to click and it was that clicking process and then relating things back to design and when it all really came together for me, I just kind of sat there and said, this is what I have to do. This is exactly what I should be doing. Um, so that, and yeah, my research call was really it for me and I've been here ever since. So, it's great. Do you guys have questions for our panelists? Yes, all the way in the back. <laughs> um, I was just noticing that the whole panel is uh, female, so with women, and um, we have a member of uh, the law school, but which is less surprising, but in engineering and science at the graduate level uh, and in academia itself, women are sadly underrepresented. So I was wondering if you could comment on, um, from your perspective, does it, is it, does it look like there's a new crest of the, the coming wave? Uh, um, is there something that you would point uh, as problems or things that you would change so the people that come behind you, the women that come behind you, have a better experience and a higher likelihood to be more representative? Just talk to people. Just, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's actually a really good question because, I mean, as you know, I do a lot of outreach um, to really try and engage uh, girls into science because I think in some ways it starts when you're young. Um, you know, you may, your parents may not expose you to science. Um, and it's the same for boys. Uh, but I think once you really get into it, there's a certain, um, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't comment on this completely, but I think there really is uh, differences in how engineering is constructed in many ways and how your attitude uh, either complements or just doesn't agree at all with how certain systems work. I mean, again, I came from fashion design where it was all girls. There, there, we had one guy in our class and he was awesome and amazing. Um, but I think it's almost like a, I think there are certain uh, uh, precedents that need to be addressed and there are a lot of, you know, NSF, a number of other um, organizations that are trying to get women into science, but I think it's also why should we care? You know, I found something very unique as well, um, which is what drove me to go into engineering because I know what I want to do. And I think that there's a lot of people who just don't know yet. And maybe that's why, you know, it, according to social norms, they then become segregated because they just don't know. You know, because the women who are in science that I've met, I mean, you, you guys are awesome and amazing. <laughs> you know, it, when you know, you know, and you do really well. So. I, I don't have a complete answer for you, uh, but I, I think things will change. Well, I think even us just being on this panel and like showing that you know women are involved in, I'm not in the hard sciences, but I'm involved in this research and I'm involved at the law school, and I think it's really, I think that's very important. Uh, my sister actually studies math. So I'm like, yeah, so I can, I can relate to your question in that sense also, is that, and I, I hear the challenges that she faces, but I, I think just doing it is really important and showing that we're here and that we're doing this research is really important. Mm -hmm. 
I think then continuing to do research. So being in a very uh, male-dominated field in, in particle physics, going to uh, summer schools, the, the gender ratio is much more approaching 50%, you know, maybe, maybe 35. But going to conferences and seeing, you know, the old guard, it's all men. So I think part of it is then continuing, keeping on in research and not, not following through that leaky pipeline. But I don't know what, what has to change to make that more appealing to women. I mean, to stay in, in research and in academia instead of going into industry where you're just less visible. I'm not sure how to change. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. I have a question for the first presenter. Um, I used to do PR and we represented scientists who were targeted in the same way um, by animal rights extremist groups that your like, clinic directors are. And one of the things that we worried about was um, telling their story and giving the terrorists the publicity that they wanted. And so I'm wondering, and I think the stories that you're telling are super important and, and it's great research, but I'm wondering if you think about that and how you sort of handle that part of it. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that we're uh, really concerned about, right? And even in, in conducting these interviews and in going through this process, we're, you know, we are, we have IRB approval, so we have a, like an extensive confidentiality um, form that we go through with our with the interview subjects and we explain to them that one of the risks is that if we publish this information there may be certain pieces of identifying information that could get out we promise not to reveal identifying information but still like the the anti-choice protesters could learn tactics right that are what is effective at um, harassment but we've we've always sort of come to the conclusion that getting this out there and constructing the narrative kind of outweighs the possible downfalls of like um, more harassment. And I don't know, and I, I'm also kind of, like aware that I don't want to legitimize the harassment at all either, right? So I think t continuing to tell the narrative is more important. So yeah, no, it's definitely something we think about all the time. I wanted to ask, um, another question, and it um, kind of came from out of two of the panels, but really could apply to all three. Um, how do, let's say, funder priorities kind of influence the the research directions that you take, whether it's um, Department of Energy priorities, you know, or Department of Defense for the for the fabric, um, and uh, in powering you know, equipment for soldiers, that sort of thing. Um, how much do you have that in your in your mind while you're while you're working? Well, the it's, there's only so many experiments that the global economy can support. So, one nice thing about having you know government grants is that they're not looking for any certain result from the experiment. You know, they, they also believe in science for the sake of science, and who knows how neutrino research could be used in 30 years, where I think, you know, sometimes private funding has more of a goal in mind when they're you know, conducting experiments. Um, but then, that being said, you know, it's nice to have experiments and then to have, um, you know, second ones that, that back, uh, back up your, your findings. and. You know, there's not enough, it can be difficult to have enough funding for subsequent experiments. Um, but actually there was recently a paper posted earlier this week where uh, a neutrino experiment, they were able to pulse a beam to send a message, you know, a transcoded into, you know, ASCII bitwise message and then detect that message at a detector. So that's one thing that's always you know interesting. How could you have you know, a neutrino telephone? Because they don't interact with almost anything. You can send a message through the earth. You know the, the solar flares that could block out communications wouldn't have any effect. You know your phone doesn't get reception in the elevator. Neutrinos wouldn't care about that. So you don't know where research could go. Um, so my research is done. I'm doing an independent study, so it's a little bit different. Um, but we have incredible support from the administration.
administration at the law school and the law faculty has been incredibly supportive. So it doesn't really impact our, our research either way. Um, I guess it's more convenient because I already have a very application-based uh, project to work on. So, you know, I do actually care about, you know, developing systems for soldiers, developing systems for the biomedical field, because it all really comes back to developing certain fundamental elements that you need to create in order to create smart textiles. Um, so I'm always thinking about that. That's always in the back of my head because, oh, I made something that's really amazing, but what am I going to use it for? You know, so for me, I, I really want to think about what's the application, why am I going to use something, and then, of course, can someone help me, you know, move along with this research and really get it rolling to a state where it could either become commercial, just pure science, um, or, actually, yeah, the, there is no more. So. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
again, I said I uh, work with nanomaterials, but you know, we're very specific and very careful, you know, which one are we using, why are we using it, how are we going to avoid any hazards. So I'd, I'd say both, really. So why don't we take, uh, take one more question, and then we can um, kind of make this more, more informal. Um, anyone have anything else they'd like to ask? Well, um, I would like to thank our, our three panelists. Um, it's fascinating, fascinating work. Um, and I am really glad that I got to be involved in this. This is one of the things when I came to work at Drexel, one of the things that I was looking forward to is meeting interesting graduate students and hearing about their work. Um, your work is really interesting, all three of you. I know your work is really interesting too. I hope I get to find out about it too. Um, and so thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.